We have Mr. Soren Sko, who is in Denmark. It's about 8 a.m. over there. He's the CEO of AP Moller Mersk. And Mr. Peter Vanneker is in Finland. He's the president and CEO of Neste Corporation. He's also featured in the documentary, by the way. And leading the panel is our moderator, Mr. Rasmus Velanko in Finland as well, the managing director for systems transportation at We Mean Business. So they're waiting patiently in the wings. In the meantime, let's take a look at what you voted for in terms of how much more you're actually willing to spend for a green long-haul flight, neck and neck, more than 50%, or sorry, more than $50, which is great. Shows a lot about the types of people who are in this conference. Are we echoing, are we echoing the sentiments across the board? Not always. And that is where the difficulties and the challenges lie, but of course also the possibilities lie in terms of the future for fuel in transportation. So I'm going to leave this now to Mr. Rasmus Velanco to take over the conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much. And that was a great introduction into this um, section of the program today, both the video that we saw and the poll that we took. Now, I want to lead with the fact that we have over 2,100 companies working with WeMe Business, our organization, who are committed to taking action on climate in different ways. At the same time, we now have over 197 countries who have signed up to the Paris Agreement. So in other words, it is very clear that the time of debating if we should take climate action is over, but now we are entering into or have very well entered already into the phase of how are we going to take action. And transport as a topic is a perfect example of some of the big challenges that we have ahead of us. We know we want to transform and transition away from fossil fuels, but how exactly are we going to do that? What are the challenges and what are the opportunities particularly for investing into this new space, this new future that we all want to build together. So I'm pleased to be joined by three leaders in their fields. And um, I'd really like to start the conversation by bringing in Søren uh, from Maersk uh, into the conversation to talk a little bit about how have these boundary conditions for doing business changed, really, the uh, opportunities that you have as a company and the shipping sector as a whole. Uh, it is no longer possible to plan the way that people had planned perhaps 10, 20 years ago. So what does the future look like? And how are the, the choices that you're making different today because of the climate science that we have staring at us in front of us? So it's very, very clear that, uh, Rasmus, that we have a climate crisis. And it's also very clear that shipping is both part of the the problem and and the and the solution here and uh, actually since we set a, a zero t a, t a carbon target in 2050 two and a half years ago in 2018 uh, we've we've come far in terms of our understanding of how how to how to achieve that it's also very clear when it comes to boundary conditions that that our customers are moving fast here uh, more than half of uh, the largest 200 customers in 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 Maersk have now set science-based targets covering all three scopes and and obviously they will expect us to help us uh, deliver those targets by providing uh, carbon neutral uh, trans transport and logistics solutions Excellent. Thank you, Soren. That's amazing to hear that over 50% have set science-based targets. It's something that we're seeing growing all the time at the moment. And uh, also just to keep in mind that, you know, it's great to see that companies are changing their approach with the science. Previously, science-based targets um, were perhaps a little less ambitious, but now with the IPCC report saying that we have to stay under 1.5 degrees, the science-based targets initiative as well is ratcheting up ambition and bringing companies along with it. Peter, I'd like to move to you. Um, again, a company that's very ambitious and you focus very much on liquid fuels. So what do you see as the biggest challenges in this transition to a decarbonized economy from your perspective? Well, that's a very good question, Rasmus. And even if I'm Mr. Burn optimist, uh, I must say that uh, it is a huge challenge that we have ahead of us. Even in the pandemic um, environment, like in the year 2020, there is about 4 billion metric tons of crude oil that has been consumed in different industries. So that's the challenge that we have ahead of us and how to replace that by uh, alternative um, sources. Um, and therefore, I think one of the biggest challenges is, of course, I mean, that we have uh, 
different solutions that we accept that different solutions will be needed. There is no silver bullet that will be able to replace, I mean, 4 billion tons um, of uh, crude oil. And for that, of course, I mean, uh, if we need all the solutions, we need to have the right regulation. Um, we also uh, need to have uh, the right decision making and being willing to accept that every solution uh, is and can be helpful uh, to attack. I mean, this uh, big challenge that we have ahead of us, instead of being too selective and prioritizing one solution over the other. So you mentioned there that there's no silver bullet, uh, something I completely agree with, and we can probably expect different approaches, maybe in different parts of the world as well. But I mean, we're talking here primarily about aviation and shipping, and these are global supply chains. Um, and there is, you know, something you said about standardization, you know, when you're talking about uh, very long and uh, complex uh, value chains and, and distribution infrastructure. Um, so how do you see this playing out, uh, Peter, in terms of, you know, aviation and shipping? We probably can't have, you know, 10 different types of fuel or energy vectors. Um, is there perhaps, you know, uh, particular technologies that you see winning out or would be preferable in a global um, scenario? Well, I think, I mean, of course, um, the first thing that the, will happen in the industry is uh, that we are moving to a sustainable aviation fuel, something that you see happening already I mean, today. Uh, whilst electrification of uh, the aviation industry, as well as eventually um, fuel cell technologies, hydrogen-based technologies or combination of these technologies will take a very, very long time. So, of course, one can say, okay, I will wait until 2060 until I have these uh, alternative technologies starting to find its way, especially, I mean, in the challenge if we talk about long haul flights, which actually count for about 70% of the greenhouse gas emissions in the aviation industry. Um, so um, I believe that uh, the solution that is at hand, that is available, uh, is actually a sustainable aviation fuel. And then it doesn't matter what type of technology you actually use to produce that molecule uh, that is a drop-in solution to the current engines and eventually future engines. Thanks, Peter. Before I go to Juliet, so I actually want to put the same question to Sora um, from a shipping point of view. I mean, again, there's a preference to have some kind of standardization, but how are you approaching this from the shipping point of view? Well, in, in, in Musk, we believe that the future fuels <clears throat> will be uh, 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 so-called power to X fuel, so e uh, green methanol and potentially also green uh, ammonia uh, for five, six uh, years uh, down, down, down the road. <clears throat> and um, th this is really good news in the sense that uh, it means that we in, in shipping will be able to continue to use the combustion engines, uh, a concept that we know uh, know very well, and and it means that pro possibly within this decade, the uh, retrofit uh, retrofit of existing engines will be, be will be possible, and therefore our our challenge today is is probably more uh, more uh, uh, how how to actually secure the fuels the green fuels uh, that we need for the future. Perfect. Thank you. Julia, turning to you now, um, I have a question. What kind of investments is, is Temasek making at the moment? And also from a, a transportation point of view and logistics point of view, how are you viewing um, these choices that are that need to be made at the moment? So, um, so at Temasek, we have uh, actually made sustainability the core of what we do. So uh, we have actually delivered the carbon neutrality as a company since about two years ago. Um, and uh, we, as with everybody else, aim to reduce the net emissions of a portfolio by half uh, of the 2010 levels by 2030 and the net zero by 2050. Now, we, we've done this in a couple of ways, um, embedding the ESG into our investment decision making uh, and then looking at management of our portfolio companies, um, impact, and then we work to understand what's the impact on our portfolio companies, engaging them on the climate change journey, um, and then we also participate in foster dialogues uh, between stakeholders to facilitate exchange of information. Now, um, I guess uh, it, from an investment perspective uh, in relation transportation uh, uh, in particular, uh, we actually have a lot of um, uh, exposure to transportation industry. 
uh, today largely through uh, investments in Singapore Airlines. And therefore, we're, we're quite happy to be working with, uh, with Peter and Neste around uh, the sustainable aviation fuels, because that's clearly um, one of the, the uh, key drivers uh, for reducing carbon emissions in that particular uh, industry. Um, uh, in terms of the investments we do, um, uh, before, before I go there, I, I forgot to mention that actually um, to bring it home for us in terms of making sustainability the core for us, we've actually redirected part of our uh, long-term incentives towards our 10-year carbon reduction targets. So, so that is to uh, ensure that we are fully aligned on this journey. Um, as an investor, we actually recognize that there is an urgent need for solutions to support the sustainable and longer uh, fulfilling uh, lives. Uh, and protecting the natural environment. So we have actually adopted a three-pronged approach to this. Uh, first is really to invest in climate-aligned op opportunities. And as an example, we've invested with Ever Technologies, which is a company that develops technology to harvest the geothermal energy. Um, and as the, uh, the audience have heard, uh, we've also partnered with BlackRock to actually form decarbonization partners that will launch a series of uh, late stage venture capital and early uh, growth private equity investment funds to crowd, uh, to crowd in investments to target um, next generation decarbonization technologies um, that will help then uh, scale and then give it the impetus to actually uh, 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 um, help with uh, developing solutions faster. We've also, uh, number two, uh, an enable carbon ne negative solutions, right? So we've, uh, to that front, we've invested with Savante, which actually specializes in low cost carbon capture technology. Um, also partner, uh, uh, done a JV with DBS, Standard Chartered and Singapore Exchange to launch Climate Impact X, which will create a global exchange and marketplace for high quality carbon credits. Um, and then the last there really is to encourage uh, businesses in its decarbonization efforts. I think the reality is this, right? We have a lot of um, uh, investments in hard to abate uh, 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 industries, but to divest them would be a cop-out way of uh, dealing with, with the issue because it actually does not uh, remove any carbon. Um, so what we've chosen to do is to work with them um, and work uh, and to catalyze new solutions. Um, and accelerate uh, industry-wide decarbonization through um, investments in technologies, um, uh, et cetera. So, so I think that's in a nutshell kind of what we've been uh, doing. Well, I have to say that's an impressive nutshell. I mean, it sounds really as if you're tackling the problem from all sides, uh, even moving into um, you know, sequestering more carbon from the atmosphere uh, through things like Climate Impact X, uh, which is a great example. Now, I mean, also listening to you, Te uh, Juliet and, and, and Peter and, and Sorry, it sounds as if you know we have the solutions um, in many ways. Uh, we essentially know what options we have to, to transition away from fossil fuels. Um, we know what we need to do inside companies and as the broader ecosystem. But I mean, looking at you know the, the IPCC reports, also you know analysis by IEA um, from the UNFCCC. We hear constantly that you know the pace of change isn't fast enough um, and there's you know a growing sense of urgency i think just in the last six months that growing sense of emergency has been incredible seeing a lot of the physical impacts of climate change throughout this year in particular so i mean this was actually brought up in in the q a as well uh, by Gwyneth freeze you know how how can we accelerate the adoption of these alternative fuels um, beyond the pace at which we have today. I mean, Soren, you've gone very far already to lead the pack essentially by stating that you want to invest or you have bought or ordered eight container ships already, you know, to operate on methanol, um, uh, even though the fuel supply necessarily isn't there yet. Uh, this is the kind of acceleration that we need to, to, to uh, engender within these different sectors. But what can you say more, Soren, about the need to accelerate and, and how can we accelerate? Yeah, I, I very much agree that we, we have a good, a, a good idea of what the solutions might be and the path to, to, to green shipping. 
uh, uh, the, the issue is, is, is twofold. We need massively scale the production of, of new fuels. And, and that's why we are uh, deciding to invest in ships uh, that can run on green methanol before uh, any green methanol basically is being produced. But we hope to, to help uh, create a, a market for that kind of fuel so we can scale for the future. And then uh, for shipping, the other thing we need to do is really to think about the regulatory uh, environment. We have one huge advantage in shipping. That is that we are a globally regulated uh, industry through uh, the uh, UN uh, IMO. And, and that means that it's actually the IMO that decides what kind of fuels that we use. And, and that means uh, we, 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 contrary to many other industries, if we regulate through IMO, we do not have the level playing fields issues that, that many other industries will have. So, so scaling up the production of fuels combined with uh, sensi sensible regulation through IMO is, is the pathway for, for shipping. But on the other hand, a lot of people have criticized the IMO for moving too slowly. Um, why should we assume that the IMO is going to move faster now? Is, has something changed? Yeah, so, so the benefit of IMO is that it's a globe, that they globally regulate the, our industry and, and that's huge. And we saw that in on the 1st of January 2020 when the whole global shipping industry went from uh, high sulfur fuels to low sulfur fuels in order to pollute less. And that was an IMO uh, mandated uh, change. Uh, the, the, the other side of the coin is uh, there are 174 members, I believe, of the IMO and, and uh, they have different interests. And therefore it takes uh, a decade to get anything serious done. So, so what we, we really need to do, all of us uh, uh, that wants to see something happen on this agenda is that we have to, we have to push for, for the IMO to, to move uh, faster. Yeah. Agreed. Not just the IMO, I think it's very common to any kind of multilateral process. Um, they tend to be very slow, but um, there is, I, I, I suppose, um, can characterize with a growing sense of urgency as well as shared responsibility moving us in the right direction. Peter, um, moving to you and on the theme of acceleration, um, you know, you're making new investments as well um, in Singapore. And uh, in the Q&A, the question about acceleration was uh, particularly about Southeast Asia. Um, can you say more specifically about what you would like to see in Southeast Asia or how to accelerate in Southeast Asia the action on climate? Yeah, very good question, Rasmus. And um, I mean, let me maybe first point, point out, I mean, what we did at Neste is that uh, we took a decision to invest in sustainable aviation fuel capacities in Singapore up to 1 million tons of so the total new capacity that we're building, which is a total of 1.3 million tons. In addition to that, in Europe, um, we took the decision then also to invest in uh, half a million tons of capacity, and that without having regulation in place. Uh, because we felt it's, it's important also that as, as, as a front runner, as a leader in the industry, that we need to demonstrate, I mean, to the regulators that this is actually possible. Um, we need to have the sustainable aviation fuel in the airports, in the planes, make the capacity available um, and hit the ground, let's say, running. Having said that, of course, you mentioned it at the beginning, um, of course, sustainable aviation fuel is substantially more expensive uh, than currently um, than uh, crude oil based kerosene. So we need to have the right regulation in place. Uh, to cross that bridge to accelerate the adoption uh, of sustainable aviation fuel. And I see very good uh, progress in that. Uh, there is very good discussions in the United States um, on an incentive mechanism. Um, there is now the proposal of the European Commission uh, to have a blending mandate, which means a minimum obligation that um, every um, fuel seller will have um, so that if a plane is leaving a certain airport in Europe, it will have to leave it with uh, a blend of sustainable aviation fuel um, with uh, fossil based kerosene. Now, the point is, if you don't have an IMO, if you don't have somebody that is, let's say, in ensuring a level playing field, then I do believe it is important that um, countries, regions, regulators, they move ahead and do not wait until uh, one is doing something and the other is not doing something. And then we want to do it all at the same time because the clock is ticking. 
the climate crisis is there. Um, and if we return back to a normal mode, then people will, of course, start flying again. Um, and then the, you, know, you have reports, I mean, from uh, um, EIA that are saying that actually the um, emissions that are coming out of the aviation industry will become an important part even more so in the future as other industries eventually would decarbon decarbonize. So that understanding is there also in the aviation industry uh, with all the players, that's the positive news. But really my message is um, governments play an extremely important role. Don't wait until um, all the governments across the world have agreed upon one yeah, measure in how to um, decarbonize the aviation industry. Thanks, Peter. Two really important themes starting to come up here, you know, the role of governments as well as, as customers. Um, let's, let's come back to governments in just a second, but I'd, I'd like to move to the customers and the cost of these technologies that you're referring to, Peter. Um, and maybe if I go to you, Juliet, um, you know, what is it going to take, do you think, for customers to, essentially, they're the ones who are going to have to pay a premium, right, for these more expensive technologies, at least initially, as they're brought down the cost curve. Um, so how do you think we can close that gap? What kind of solutions uh, have you seen from your experience of uh, particularly, let's say, the shipping industry? Yeah, unfortunately, the transportation industry has the poorest record of getting its customers to help with paying for any additional fuel costs. So <laughs> may it be extra fuel surcharge that you have to pay when you fly, um, to uh, charging, passing on uh, additional uh, uh, shipping bunker costs to your customers. So, so actually, it's it's very hard. Historically, not been uh, very successful. Um, and I guess to put it in perspective, fuel cost as a percentage of opex for transport companies would actually vary. So, it it, it it's about thirty percent for airlines, fourteen percent thereabouts for shipping companies, and eleven percent for trucking. Um, on average, for um, companies, actually, transportation costs makes up about 50% of the transportation costs. So no wonder, you know, whenever they're sensitive to increases in uh, um, fuel costs uh, or, or, or increases, increases in transportation costs because of fuel charges. So, um, and logistics costs actually, on, uh, on the other hand, would actually vary with different industries, right? So generally, it's between... 11, 10 to 15 percent of total OPEX for any uh, uh, industry uh, industries uh, of, of businesses. So actually, it's a very small part of the um, of the total OPEX, generally speaking. Um, and but that's where they typically tend to uh, squeeze out a lot of cost uh, and trying to optimize that. So um, and and that's largely because it's actually driven by the availability of transportation capacity and a lot of other alternatives. So if, if, uh, so if all, one operator or one, one carrier decides to um, increase the uh, uh, pile in a green premium or additional cost for because it's green shipping, um, the customer has an alternative because there will be maybe perhaps others would actually not do it. Um, and they will go uh, source the cheaper uh, alternative. Um, but in there also uh, highlights the point, transportation is actually just one piece of the entire uh, climate uh, equation. And um, the industries, businesses, and actually the issue is present across the entire value chain. So from the point in time, any product is being conceptualized and produced and then eventually bought by consumers, delivered and bought by consumers, is actually, if you look across the entire value chain, it's actually a very complex one. So transportation is just one end, um, and actually, if everybody along the way actually does not so-called play ball and uh, uh, impute that the, the, carbon, the, the carbon pricing or the green premium along the way, then the consumers at the other end will never pay. So I, unfortunately, um, I think the, the only mechanisms that will uh, work really is to consistently shift the, the carbon cost curve for everyone along in the industry, along uh, 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 for all the customers along the value chain before the end customers will actually end up paying um, for this. So, um, but unfortunately, I think we live in a world that's highly fragmented, high competitive pressures along with the suppliers will actually make this um, 
will, will actually uh, prevent the um, whole industry to actually factor in the real cost for climate change. Yeah, I mean, that's a very fascinating just because we had the poll at the beginning of this session where over half the people, well over half the, the people, you know, wanted to pay $50 or more. Um, but I suppose the question is, you know, in a different situation when you're about to press, you know, the booking button on the web browser between two flights and one is $50 or $100 cheaper, which one do you pick? Um, but it almost, it sounds as if what you're saying, Juliet, is that there needs to be a mechanism to create a floor in the markets. Uh, and perhaps Absolutely. that's the regulator, maybe that's the IMO, Soren, that you were talking about. Do you see the same dynamic, uh, Soren, in the shipping industry among your customers? Do you think there is that willingness to pay? I'm marginally more optimistic than uh, Juliet on this one here. And because, as I said to begin with, uh, our largest customers are actually signing uh, science-based targets for all of their three scopes. And that actually will force them to do something uh, about uh, about their scope three uh, emissions. And and uh, we are today already selling a biofuel based uh, carbon neutral transportation product, which is growing uh, quite nicely, of course, from a very very small base. But 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 nevertheless, there are customers out there today in container shipping that are willing to pay a premium. The, this is of course the big global brands, the big uh, global retailers, and so on. And they make up maybe only. 10 or 20 percent of our of, of of the business at some point uh, clearly uh, I, I very much agree with with Juliet the, uh, on the, on the fact that at some point we definitely need a, a carbon uh, carbon uh, tax or whatever you want to call it uh, to help uh, notch uh, customers uh, towards the the, the the green fuels it's only really the the, the 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 large global brands that can afford to pay if you will uh, a, a premium uh, to to, uh, to to support their own brands Thanks, sir. So I actually want to move now to the government's role and the policymaker role. And Peter, you brought this up quite strongly just um, uh, previously. And what I really like about what you said is that, you know, we need to get past this dynamic of essentially pointing fingers that you should do this and you should do that. Um, we all need to act. Um, different stakeholders have different roles. But you know, from, from where I stand, I've seen much better collaboration between companies, also across sectors in value chains. But I've yet to see, let's say, a, a sense of shared responsibility or a shared plan together with government at the moment. And how would you say that we could improve the collaboration between business and governments on this topic in particular? Well, I, I would say, I mean, it is. It is happening, Rasmus. No, it's not that, for example, if the European Commission came out with the Fit for 55, they have done quite a lot of work together yeah, with uh, NGOs on one hand side, but also captains of industry, leaders, front runners in the industry to come up uh, with those proposals. It's not that this happened now uh, in their offices or home offices and then suddenly Surprise, surprise. I mean, here it is. It's the proposal. And then we're going to now discuss it with the parliament and the council. Um, having said that, also, I do believe, I mean, just maybe going back a little bit, it's not just the government. Yeah, um, I do also agree with what Soren is saying. You see that there are front runners as well um, in the business. I mean, big brands. Uh, you see that consultancy companies, for example, um, the recent example that we have is that we have a cooperation with Boston, uh, Boston Consulting Group and they want to reduce their scope three emissions. So they will start flying again now that the pandemic is almost over. And how can they actually um, uh, reduce their scope three emissions? Uh, because that's the big part of their scope three emissions. Yeah, And that's where we have a business model that we have developed whereby we are uh, supplying, so to say, them the sustainable aviation fuel. That means the certificates on one hand side and the physical product is going to the, to the, to the airlines, to the carriers that they are using. Yeah, so it's governance plus also uh, the willingness uh, of uh, big brands uh, to do this. And um, of course, I mean, the investors do play a very important role in that as well. Yeah, because if the investors are putting, let's say, articulating that and making it very visible what they actually expect uh, from the, co the, uh, the companies that they are investing in, um, that will also drive more focus on scope three 
um, emission reductions. So it's these three elements, but back, I mean, to the government, I mean, in terms of the government, um, I think one thing is very important is um, a consistent regulation. Yeah, I mean, lots of these things that we are talking about, they demand huge amounts of investments. Soren talked about it as well. Yeah, he, he is investing in new vessels, but he doesn't have the molecules yet yeah, to operate, I mean, those vessels. Now, in order to have those molecules in sufficient amounts, it's just like sustainable aviation fuel. Well, one and a half billion euros just to have one manufacturing site in Singapore, that's a lot of money. In addition to that, you need 6,000 people to build up such, such a capacity. Yeah, and these are skilled people to build that up. So that means that if, you, if we talk about regulation, regulation may not change every year or every other year. It needs to be a very consistent regulation that is actually setting what do we want to achieve in 2030? What do we want to achieve in 2050? And what's the pathway? How do we get there from year to year? And then we stick to that and make sure that we actually achieve that. Uh, that will be very helpful, I believe, in accelerating. And that's the discussions that we have with different governments. And I know from our peers that they have the same type of discussions um, also with the regulators. So coming back to your question, I, I don't see that the regulator is far away now from the leaders in the industry. Uh, there is a very intensive collaboration. Um, same, I mean, we are having very intensive discussions, I mean, with um, Singapore Airlines, with the Singapore Airport, uh, with the Singaporean government, uh, Juliet mentioned it also with, with Temasek and so on, to make it physically possible that sustainable aviation fuel can actually also help Singapore Airlines and all the flights that are coming out of Singapore um, would uh, have a lower greenhouse gas emission impact. Yeah, so, so Rasmus, maybe I could um, maybe add uh, one thing. I totally agree with what Peter said, right? Um, and, and I think the point that he, he made about governments uh, needing to put up a clear roadmap, I think the clear roadmap uh, of where um, this whole uh, agenda needs to go is actually very critical. Um, and it's, it needs to be clear to align the public and private uh, views and actions, right? Um, but I think perhaps maybe one, one other thing to add to that really is governments need to be courageous as well, right? Because then I think they need to also, while, while they kind of like think about um, and, and, and sign up to the Paris Agreement and, and need, knowing that this is, this is something they need to do, they need to be courageous because a lot of times governments like companies need to also make choices. It's the short term versus long term, right? Is it, is it today and the next elections? Or is it something that um, that we need to uh, map out? What what's that? What's the future for for the country and the world? Not just the world, but just for the country as well in time to come, in the long term. And um, and they have to make those choices too. And uh, and maybe the call is really for governments to be courageous in that move um, and be prepared to actually uh, while have that long term view, but have more agile regulations along the way to be able to encourage more innovative um, solutions and to be able to uh, have trade policies that will help uh, enable um, the, the change uh, for climate, right? And, and uh, perhaps, for example, reducing tariff barriers, right? On green goods, as an example, while setting stand industry standards um, in terms of performance of what you wanna expect that will fit the, the climate agenda. Yeah, Julia. If I, Rasmus, if I may add, I mean, something to that point as well, if you allow me, I mean, is that um, from time to time, one, uh, the, the regulator should focus on the big issue. I mentioned at the beginning, we have 4 billion tons in a pandemic year of crude oil that is being consumed with its respective, I mean, green, greenhouse gas emissions. That's the big element that we have. That's the elephant that we have in the middle of our table. Yeah. From time to time, I have the impression, if I talk, I mean, to the authorities, to the government, that they are going in the new solutions that help reducing greenhouse gas emissions in such detail uh, on what can you use, what can you not use, where can it come from? If I compare how crude oil today is being regulated, well, it's free for everybody, so to say. There's almost no regulation around it. If you look at the other hand side, Take the example of sustainable aviation fuel. What waste can you use? What waste can you not use? I mean, this is highly complex and highly detailed. And from time to time, I'm saying that 
can we please just stop it? I mean, if you make the solution too small because of all your limitations, then we're not going to address, I mean, the big problem either, which is the 4 billion. Yeah, and you, you crowd out the space for innovation and, and new options that weren't on the table yesterday. Um, we've seen that particularly on the fuel side when it comes to some of the synthetic fuels. Um, originally, the regulations in Europe, for example, were geared towards biofuels. And so we have a problem with being able to capture CO2 from the atmosphere and putting that into synthetic fuel today. Julia, I want to pick up on your point about courageous action by governments. And we actually have a couple of questions in the Q&A linked to Temasek um, transport. And can you identify maybe a couple of examples, uh, if you can think of them from top of your head, where both Temasek and the Singaporean government had been courageous in terms of promoting either energy efficiency or electric vehicles in transport? So, so we're, we're a bit slow on the we're, we're a bit slow on EVs in Singapore, actually. So, uh, but we're finally on the on the way uh, on that. But I think um, how could we be more courageous on that front then? On EVs, I, th yeah. I think it's I um um I think the reality is um, EVs to us really okay. So so EVs for for Singapore as a as a country that is actually advocating for no cars. EVs does not make any difference, right? So, so it's a EVs is a one for one kind of exchange if you if you think about it from that perspective. So, for a car light for for a country that's trying to go on car light, then you really want to go with no cars, and um, and the way to go really is to go maybe AVs and do car sharing, right? Um, and and do more cycling. Well, not that Singapore is very good with cycling. The weather doesn't really help with cycling, not like in Finland or in Copenhagen. Um, but really, uh, sharing is the way to go. So, so I think maybe perhaps me in terms of trying to be courageous, maybe one of the more recent examples, I would say, is um, we have actually uh, um, uh, we're signed an MOU with the MPA, this Maritime uh, and Port Authority of Singapore, to try and explore. Um, uh, decarbonization solutions for uh, for the shipping industry, um, and uh, and also decarbonization solutions for port operations. Um, we, I, we hope we can do more. This is just one of them. And then the other example, as as we ha highlighted earlier on, really is around the the create or the uh, um, the development of sustainable aviation fuels because that's really quite key. Uh, for us um, in Singapore, because as the hub for maritime hub, as well as the aviation hub, uh, the fuel side for transportation is actually absolutely critical. And we're, we're one of the largest bunkering um, uh, hubs for, for maritime fuel. We want to be able to ensure that we also do the same for the uh, aviation uh, fuel. So, so that's that's where we're actually looking to, um, which is why we're collaborating in, uh, in the studies for the uh, SAF fuels, um, and then looking to see how we can look uh, to actually uh, invest money to um, actually help scale it up. Thanks, Juliet. Sorry, over to you. Uh, we've been talking quite a lot about Singapore, and um, I'd be keen to understand your perspective. Like, how do you see Singapore um, as a hub for shipping activity and, and what kind of a role could it play? Um, is, there, is there a role that Singapore could play to catalyze an action uh, more globally as well on the shipping industry? So on the, on the regulatory side, Singapore speaks with a fairly large voice in the IMO because of the many ships that are actually based in, 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 in Singapore. And of course, I can only urge Singapore to continue to push on, on, on this agenda uh, to get to create the right regulations through through our role. Uh, as, as Juliet also pointed out, Singapore is one of the largest bunkering ports in the world. So, so obviously we will need the, the, uh, the infrastructure uh, to, to bunker methanol and, and potentially eventually also uh, ammonia. And, and, and because of the, if you will, the, the, the toxic nature of that, that type of fuel, then, then, then it is a new infrastructure and, and, uh, and a more complicated infrastructure that will, uh, that, 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 that will be uh, uh, needed. Uh, but I find I'm, I'm, I'm sure that uh, actually the Singapore will, will already is and, and, and will continue to work on these things. Thank you. 
Let me shift track a little bit here. Um, and we've talked about very many different stakeholders. We've talked about the customers, the supply side as well. We've talked about governments and, and investors as well. Um, it's, it's a whole ecosystem that needs to be aligned in terms of an objective of staying 1 .5, below 1.5 degrees centigrade. And everybody needs to do their part. But often there is a bit of a chicken and egg situation as well, right? Typically between supply and demand. And Peter, you referred to this example with Boston Consulting Group, and, and I'm aware of a couple of other good examples, particularly on aviation. One um, is Clean Skies for Tomorrow um, under the Mission Possible Partnership. Again, trying to aggregate demand for the sustainable aviation fuels um, so that investment can be made into the production facilities and, and finding a way to reward those customers through you know, certification as well. Um, this kind of, let's say, working together among a group of customers or, or demand side and a group on the supply side is becoming a bit more prevalent. And into those conversations are then also coming the governments and the investors. Um, can you, Peter, talk a little bit about, you know, is this the new way of working? Is this what it's going to, what acceleration essentially means, how we're going to get to having solutions on the ground faster? Yeah, uh, good comment, I mean, Rasmus, and I do believe it is um, really like you described it, and you gave a very good example, and that is uh, 60 companies uh, just recently, a couple of days ago, yeah, the announcement came out on the Clean Sky for Tomorrow. I mean, these are six, 60 companies that actually uh, are across the globe that have committed to working together uh, on the adaptation of sustainable aviation fuel yeah, with clear targets uh, that have been set, uh, path to net zero uh, by 2050. Yeah, so um, these are the initiatives that I believe um, it will take. Yeah. But having said that, I do see already that there is quite a lot going on. Uh, um, so if, if, if I take very concrete examples, I talked about Singapore already, yeah? I mean, all the different parties that are involved to make sustainable aviation fuel in Singapore airports, I mean, happening. Because you need to have the end-to-end -end supply chain set up, yeah? Um, and I encourage, of course, I mean, companies that are in Singapore to, to also look at their scope three emissions and also add, let's say, and come to the table in um, doing the same kind of things like Boston Consulting is doing or other companies are doing. Yeah, um, and, and that is uh, already asking for the products. I mean, if people said at the beginning for an intercontinental flight, long haul flight, I'm willing to pay yeah, $50 on my tickets uh, more, well, uh, that is already helping quite a lot. I mean, if everybody would really do that um, and then demand, uh, let's say, that their flights were um, taking place with sustainable aviation fuel, um, at the beginning, it will not be a blend of 50%. Yeah, this will go gradually. It will be a blend of 5% and then eventually going up, I mean, to 10%. The European Commission then goes to above, I mean, 60% uh, later in, um, in the, the next decade. Uh, so your $50, let's say, on a long-haul flight, you probably would, would give you somewhere between a 5 and 10% blend uh, already. Yeah? So, but I fully believe, I mean, what you say, this, um, the, peop the parties need to come together across the value chain, uh, and there will be different business models that will work uh, to make this happen. Uh, so it's not just the standard business model. You have the physical molecule and you're supplying it, I mean, to an airline. But there are, like in this case, I mean, Boston Consulting, uh, where you can physically uh, separate uh, the certificate, I mean, from um, the supply of the molecule. Exactly. One other maybe thing I can add to yeah. that, uh, Rasmus. Maybe I can add to that. Uh, I think this concept of these buying clubs is, is clearly a good idea. And in various forums, they are trying to get it be organized, including in, in the world uh, e e e economic. Uh, forum, but but what I wanted to to really add is that you know we we can afford this if we want to. I mean, fifty dollars on a or fifty or hundred dollars on a on an international airline ticket. I mean, all of us are old enough to realize that actually flying has only gotten cheaper in our lifetime. Uh, and and frankly, frankly, if, if we do the same math for for container shipping, 
-hmm. you know, we think that the green fuels would be about three times as expensive uh, when we get them compared to what we're paying today. That sounds like a lot, and especially for me when we spend $5 billion on fuel. But if you start calculating on the cost of the final product, it doesn't actually matter. We, we spend $400 per container we ship in terms of fuel, $400. Uh, and uh, if that triples, we would be spending $800 more. But in a container, there will be 8,000 pairs of sneakers. It's 10 euro cents or 10 cents per, per pair of sneakers. So I think the world can actually afford to pay for decarbonization. For me, the issue is much more, uh, frankly, the scaling uh, problem we have. And there, there we, we really have to, 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 to get the regulation, the global, the regional regulations in place. We need to get the efficiency standards up. And then finally, we certainly need also governments to look at permitting. Because one of the big issues is going to be that we're going to have to build a lot of renewable energy to make this happen, a lot. And, and if it takes you know, five, seven years, as it does in some countries in Europe, to get the permit to just build a wind farm, then, 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 then we will be, it will be a long time before we solve the, solve the issues. Yeah, so a clear role there as well in, for the government in terms of speeding up permitting. Uh, and we've heard that in a lot of jurisdictions, actually. I'd like to just dig into, because I was going to ask something very similar to you, Soren, um, into the, the shipping industry. And, and the example Peter spoke about, I mean, I'm aware that the Global Maritime Forum is working on, on similar types of you know, demand clubs, et cetera. And, and there's a concept of developing green shipping corridors, essentially. Um, how is, is, do you find that that is similar to the situation that Peter talked about when it comes to corporate flying? Or... Are there some key differences? And what I'd really also want to hear, um, if you're allowed to say and, and, and in this audience, is does Singapore have a role um, or anything in the plans of being part of the first green shipping corridors? Look, I think for container shipping, uh, it's uh, it's easier than it is for uh, bulk and tanker shipping. Uh, I mean, we run our ships in, 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 in a fixed network, very much like an airline. Whereas, uh, and, and, and most of those networks, they pass through Singapore at, at some point. So, so, so there's a good reason for why Singapore is one of the, the global, uh, one of the large global bunkering uh, ports. Uh, it's the geographic location. And, uh, and I'm, 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 I'm absolutely sure that Singapore is very uh, aware of that. And, and, uh, and that Singapore is thinking about how, what, what it means for the bunkering infrastructure in the, in the, in the coming years. Yeah. Juliet, over to you. Talking about Singapore as being very much a hub for transport, um, particularly on shipping, we've seen some big changes during COVID around the patterns of the movements of goods. Um, we've also seen incredible increases in the prices of, of shipping as well. Now, maybe putting your supply chain, let's say, and logistics um, hats on for a moment, um, you know, are there any other ways? other than changing the fuel that you see potentially um, you know, having a big impact on climate change? You know, is, there, is there a potential, for example, to ship less or more efficiently or reorganize maybe the way that the, the goods are produced and moved around the world? So, so, so the reality is, um... The global trade and logistics, uh, the, the transportation logistics for global trade is actually as efficient, is, is very efficient prior to COVID. The, the reality is it, it's, uh, we have come a very long way in trying to optimize um, the movements. A large part of uh, close to 70% of, of the global uh, freight that moves um, is actually done on shipping. So, so actually, we've, we've been very, very efficient. Um, and the industry is a lot more consolidated than they were even, I would say, what, five, 10 years ago, uh, as recent as that. So it's a very consolidated space, and we are actually very efficient. And, you, and, the, and the world has, um, again, prior to COVID, has found a, um, a, a way of uh, operating in the most efficient manner. Right, so so countries with the most the best competitive advantage to produce stuff at the lower cost would be the country of produce uh, produce uh, supplier, right? So, and um, and we've gone really and and have been operating on a just in time kind of model, um, and 
but I guess post COVID and what, what COVID has shown us is the disruptions in the supply chain. It's not because we don't have ships and we don't have capacity. Uh, maybe the airlines capacity have, uh, has uh, shrunk because of uh, border closure. Um, but practically speaking, um, the, the capacity, global capacity still exists. So, but I think what COVID and disruptions have shown us really is with uh, companies and countries have gone from just in time to just in case. So I think going forward, what we are more likely to see is more just in case kind of uh, supply chains um, forming. And uh, you're more likely to see businesses looking to diversify supply sources or demanding for their supplies to set up alternative manufacturing uh, sites in different regions. Um, in the same way, their customers are also maybe demanding the same. So unfortunately, I think it's maybe not going to help with much of the um, uh, saving on, on energy efficiency. In fact, I, I think that's going to drive a lot of um, demand for onshoring uh, of warehousing, onshore warehousing, as well as uh, because forward stocking is going to happen. Um, and unfortunately, I think what we are missing from this panel really is the trucking space, the overland. And I think what we will actually see a lot more happening is overland uh, transportation with um, increased need for regional distribution and so on. So I think the move towards EVs or AVs over time would be one way of um, uh, trying to manage this uh, uh, increase in carbon uh, emissions. Um, but perhaps maybe what we uh, have actually seen even prior to COVID is the, the um, business models where people are actually sharing more assets. Um, and actually that happens quite a bit on the ship in the shipping uh, 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 industry already, right? In terms of sharing, buying capacity of each other um, uh, through the alliances and so on. Um, the question really is, we've seen, while we've seen things like code share uh, in the airline space, I wonder whether it, calls for um, a slightly different business model going forward where maybe we can share aircraft like Uber um, uh, going forward. Because um, if, if uh, border closures are going to, well, knock on wood, hopefully it, it gets better and, and borders do open. Uh, but for the next pandemic or the next pandemic X, um, when that happens, then perhaps maybe we need to be thinking about a, a new business model for the airlines. Maybe uh, sharing of assets is one way to go uh, in terms of um, uh, saving up on uh, uh, carbon emissions. Um, obviously, over land, you've got uh, other ways of doing that where you do route optimization and so on and so forth. But maybe perhaps uh, as consumers, maybe if you buy less, if you buy only what you need rather than buy everything that you see online, um, and if you can buy uh, and not demand for on-demand delivery uh, or instant delivery, that will help uh, with uh, uh, allowing the transport and logistics service providers to aggregate the, uh, the loads before they ship it off to you. Uh, I think that helps as consumers. So, okay. so do less online shopping. Thank you, Juliet. That's all, um, a wide range of things. I just want to pick up on the the moving from just in time to just in case. Um, I mean, we we were talking about the context of the pandemic, but as we've seen and what we can expect is that we will have more disruptions because of climate change to global supply chains. So, in some senses, moving to a just in case model may actually be beneficial in building more resilience um, to the global supply chains as well. We have um, a little bit of time uh, left, not too much, unfortunately. Um, would love to speak more, but I, I do want to move over to one one big topic um, here. I mean, we've talked a lot about the need to show leadership and accelerate action, and we've talked about the roles of different stakeholders in the system. Um, I want to ask Peter and Soren. You both have, um, you know examples of companies who have shown leadership within your sectors in particular. Peter, in terms of, you know, uh, moving into uh, biofuels at a very early stage um, and continuing to uh, invest in that, even when the headwinds were very strong, 
uh, which has become a success story. And now also then moving into more sustainable chemicals production as well, uh, building on that you know, asset base um, and, and, and knowledge uh, that you have as well. I mean, you are moving ahead of the pack, let's admit it, um, and, and that is very positive. Um, but what has it taken for a company like Nested to be able to make some of those very, let's say, some would argue very risky investments early? Um, what are the ingredients that have been needed? Yeah, I think it starts all, I mean, with a purpose. Yeah, so we have a very well articulated purpose in our company. And that is creating a healthier planet for our uh, children. Um, every person that we are hiring um, is not just being looked at, do they have the skills and capabilities? But uh, even more so, we are looking at, do they with their heart talk about the purpose? Do we feel that they are inspired uh, by the purpose? And of course, at the time when the company did make these uh, very bold decisions, then there were lots of com uh, people that left the company because they didn't find the company anymore as they had you know, started working for. Uh, so it was a big transformation. And of course, that transformation doesn't, doesn't stop. Um, but then, of course, we were little by little able, I mean, to build up that culture um, uh, inside of the company. And now, of course, as we are developing our company much more international, um, it means that it's extremely important that we have the people on board um, that do believe in, in our purpose. The other thing I, I do believe is, and that's maybe also if we have an international audience, I myself am not Finnish, yeah, um, but rather coming from Belgium. Um, and if, if, if you have uh, a company in Finland and you're confronted with the nature every day, um, then you also need to survive in an international environment. That means that you need to have it from innovation. Innovation needs to be part of the DNA. And that innovation as part of the DNA combined then also with sustainability because you live with the nature every day makes then um, that, that core, let's say, in beliefs that you have in these, in these companies. Um, so I think that has helped uh, also quite a lot. <clears throat> and even if people talk about sustainable aviation fuel these days and a bit in our discussion now as this is something that is for the future, well, it's with that leadership position is by making it happen that, um, I mean, today we have more than 30 customers for sustainable aviation fuel and we have more than 20 airports that are using sustainable aviation fuel. So it's, it's happening is my message. Yeah? That's why I'm a stubborn optimist. Thank you, Peter. And so very much the same question to you, sir. I mean, um, behind the scenes, I think your company and, and you probably personally as well is, is very much the driving force for a lot of the collaborative action to decarbonize this industry. Where does this come from? What are the ingredients in your company? Well, I, I actually think it's it's quite uh, similar to the NIST uh, the NIST, uh, 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 situation. I mean, we we have always considered ourselves to be a purpose and values driven uh, company. And 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 one of the characteristics of such a company is that it thinks about creating value not just for shareholders but also for customers, for employees, and for 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 society at, at large. And 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 therefore wanting to do uh, the, the 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 right thing. And I can certainly only encourage uh, anybody listening who sits in a business in the business world today to, to see this uh, uh, not as a technical problem or a cost problem, or, but, but as an opportunity. The world needs a whole new uh, uh, energy system to, to de decarbonize. And, and, and you know, when, when these kind of shifts happen, it's also it's also opportunity for for companies to stand out and to to accelerate and 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 therefore uh, you know we've decided not to focus on on all the issues but 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 focus on what we can actually make happen and then I'm sure that that you know as our customers pick up on 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 carbon neutral shipping and logistics that we will also be there to benefit as a business. So really, I love how we've. Um potentially set up this panel to be having a very technical conversation about fuels and, and supply chains and, and technologies, but somehow we've moved to the end to be talking about the importance of, of people. Um, and, and also, you know, 
I think where we are today is, is, is actually quite positive in the sense that there's a sense of that this is possible. Um, you know, let's not focus on, you know, what might not be going exactly according to plan, but focus on what we as individuals inside the system um, or individual organizations can do uh, to support. But we only have one minute left of time allotted to us. So with that, I'm going to challenge each three of you with uh, 20 seconds to tell me if you had a magic wand, I suppose, and you could change one thing um, to decarbonize transports, what would you like to see happen? And let me start with you, Juliet. Um, remove the inertia, essentially, right? Um, I want to quote uh, Steve Howard, our chief uh, sustainability officer. And, and he said this very inspirational uh, uh, thing. He said, we could be the generation that, uh, that ends global warming. And, um, and I think we can do that. If you have magic one, I think if we have uh, take, removed that inertia, we will be able to do wonders. Excellent. Peter? Well, it's two words, start today. Excellent. Very similar. And Soren? Yeah, I, I, I hope that the, the politicians around the world will become as ambitious on this agenda as uh, leading businesses are. Excellent. Thank you so much to my speakers in this panel. Um, and I look forward to continuing the conversation with you. Thank you. Thank you.